Hey everybody, we are live for ESOL teacher certification exam. My name is Kathleen and I am excited to be here with you today. So I'm just checking all my social media to make sure that I am going hey live. Ooh, we are live got to turn that ESOL down, sorry. All right, so really excited to be here with you today. We are live for a teacher certification exam the ESOL ESL. So if you can hear me and see me, let me know. I'm live on social media and some other places. And if you were, uh, if you signed up for this, you're in the chat and in like the webinar area here. So Margarita, welcome. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for all the great videos. Got your book through Amazon. Awesome, Margarita. Thank you so much for being here. Let me know in the chat that you can hear me, see me. I'm trying to make sure that I'm live on, um, Facebook. So let me just make sure here real quick. Talk amongst yourselves because it looks like uh, I need to make sure that. Let's see here. Ah, I see. It didn't do the thing it was supposed to do. So give me one second because I need to go live on Facebook. So today we are doing the ESOL exam, um, and this is going to help you with any teacher certification exam. Um, that deals with ESOL or ESL. We're going to talk about structure. We're going to talk about content. We're going to talk about um, all different things. So today is going to be kind of an overview of the test itself. And then, of course, we're going to get into some practice test questions. All right, people are starting to come in. Everybody can hear. Yes, you can see me. Perfect, perfect. All right, so really quickly, my name is Kathleen Jasper. And for the last 10 years or so, I've been helping teachers and prospective school leaders pass their certification exams. So we specialize in praxis exams. But all of these exams kind of do the same thing. I used to be a high school biology reading and English language arts teacher. Then I became an assistant principal. And um, I also had the opportunity to work downtown in curriculum. And that's when I learned a lot about testing, standardized tests, big testing companies and how they do it and all that. And I've used that knowledge to build my own company and be with you here with you today. So I am very, um, I'm very excited to be here. Somebody's asking if this is the same info from the webinar in December. Yes, it is going to be the same, but I have some new resources. You may want to stick around for the first couple of minutes because we've added some things to the course that I wanted to share with you today. So I am super glad um, you guys are here. Oh, somebody's taking their praxis at 440 Eastern. They're nervous. Okay, Gail, don't be nervous. It's fine. Um, a lot of people get nervous about the test, which is totally understandable. But the thing is, it's like, you know, you just take it. You don't need an A. You need like a high D, low C on this exam to pass it. People think, oh, I got to do like get a hundred. You don't need a hundred. You need a D and you can pass. So um, I don't recommend you shoot for a D. I would recommend a high C, mid B, you know, but if you've been taking the practice test and you're getting 75 to 85% correct, you're ready. So it's okay. And I'm going to show you some strategy today on how to do that. All right. So it looks like we are live on Facebook and all of that. Very good. Let me just check YouTube. And it looks like I'm live there. Okay, wonderful. Now, listen, if you're watching me on social media um, and you want the webinar handouts, which is like a free study guide, and you want the resources and all of that that I'm going to be talking about today, you can click the link in the description and it will take you to a place to sign up. There's a link in the description to buy the ESOL products. Below that is the link to sign up for the free webinar and you can get all the resources there. Okay. Now, for those of you who are part of the webinar, you are going to receive an email from me about 30 minutes to an hour after the webinar is over with everything we talked about today, a replay link. So you can play this again, the free study guide again, and an offer code for 20% off the products that I have for ESOL. Okay. So, um, let me talk to you guys a little bit about this particular exam and what I have for it. So um, I specialize in test prep, obviously, and I know a lot about the ESOL exams across the country. So there are certain testing companies who make one ESOL exam, and then there's another testing company that makes another ESOL exam. But when you look at the test specs and the blueprints and the practice test questions and all of that, they are the same. They just have them in a different order, um, but all of the concepts are still the same. ESL, ESOL education, these are English speakers of other languages or English as a second language. So these are the students who come into your room who may or may not know English yet, who may not be proficient yet. And you have to um, not only teach these students, 
you know, the academic standards, the regular stuff that they need to know in order to be successful in American public schools. But you also have to build in strategies to assist these students. So it can be very complicated. Now, this test, in terms of the structure and all of that, there are a lot of hints in the questions because it's the position of the of the state that you guys, a lot of you are just beginning teachers. And so you don't know all of this yet. So um, there are certain hints in the questions and I'm going to show you that today. I'm also going to show you how to work backward. If you've seen my videos on YouTube, you know, I'm going to tell you to work backward on your test. It's going to help you with those scenario based questions. And um, I'm going to show you some strategy today and we're going to work on specific questions. Okay. Let me just hop over to the chat and answer any questions here. Also, I have a colleague in the chat. Her name is Yana. She's going to help answer questions while I'm in the presentation mode because I can't do both. I can't present and answer questions. And I know a lot of you guys um, have questions to ask. So one of the question is, uh, does this apply to New York? This applies to any state test that has to do with ESOL. This particular program, and this is the physical book, it's a line I've taken every spec I could and wrote a book regarding the spec. So when we say spec, I mean the test specifications. So I looked at the ones in New York. I looked at the ones in Texas. I looked at the ones in New Jersey, the ETS, all of that. And I put together a guide that kind of encompasses everything. Um, now, if you're looking for exact test questions that are going to appear on your exact test, you're not going to get that. There's no way for me to know exactly what test you're taking. It's a state standardized assessment. They have item banks that are gigantic. We're not supposed to know what's going on. Okay. So my, my advice to you is really to understand these concepts so that no matter what way you're asked, you can navigate that. Okay. Now, some states require writing for the ESOL. Some states don't. So for example, if you're taking the Praxis ESOL, you do not have a writing component. But if you're taking the Pearson view, if one, one of yours is administered by Pearson view, you are taking the writing. But the good news is, is that I have writing in this. And even if you don't have a writing task, you should still do the writing in the study guide because it's going to help you think critically about the multiple choice uh, test questions. So it's always better to do that application of your knowledge because it pushes you up that Bloom's taxonomy that I talk about in my videos and helps you with critical thinking. All right. Um, I am planning to take the VCLA reading and writing any of your courses to use for the, that's the Virginia. Yes, I have lots of courses that align with the Virginia. You can send us an email if you have questions about other products at info at KathleenJasper.com and it'll be our pleasure to help you. Today I am going to focus on the ESOL and um, we're going to focus on that, but I can take questions about other tests later. All right. So Yana has um, chimed in. Her name is uh, Yana Bossi. She's under host and she's going to give you guys some offer codes and some links and things like that. Okay. So the ESOL, if you're taking the ESOL Praxis, it's considered the Praxis 2, which is a subject area exam. The Praxis 1 is the Praxis Core, which is reading, writing, math, and uh, grammar. Um, reading, writing, reading, writing, math, and grammar. Yes. Um, that's a little different. It's like an SAT. This is an actual subject area. You're going to have to understand how to teach ESOL students. So there's going to be teaching scenarios on there and all of that. And it's, it's, my book is structured in a way to cover all that content category. All right. So let me show you really quickly, um, some of the things that you received with this, um, with this free webinar. That's what it's called, a webinar. Hang on one second. All right. So with the free webinar, you got this, these ESOL handouts. Now, listen, if you don't have the handouts in front of you, it's fine. I'm going to project them on the screen as we go through them. So don't worry about that. But you've got this here. If you want the actual study guide, you can click this link in the handouts. And that will, the, the full study guide is much bigger. The full study guide is on 76 pages. So this is the actual full study guide. That's this purple study guide. It's in digital form here. Notice that we have um, six content categories and we even have the writing task here. So if you are taking writing, you or if your test has writing on it, we have you covered here. And then we have reference pages, good words list, bad words list. I'll talk a lot about good words. You can see these are all the good words you should be on the lookout for in the answer choices. These are the words that mean, hey, this is the correct answer. And these are bad words that you want to 
um, avoid. And I have all of that in there for you. Now, um, we're going to talk about a lot of those today, but this is the full study guide. Sometimes after the webinar, people say, hey, where's the 176 page book? Well, that's the paid study guide. You got to buy that one. Uh, but this one is good too. If you're looking for free resources, a lot of people just use my free stuff. Now, let me go back here really quickly. Let me show you quickly before we get started where you can get additional resources if you like this webinar and you like the free study guide and you want more. All right. So on my website, KathleenJasper.com, I have a bunch of free and paid stuff. Right now we're under the free webinars tab. You signed up for this on that tab. Um, but if you go to our programs and you go to Esau, you can see that I have a study guide. It's the light purple and I have an online course. Now, when you buy the study guide and you're going to get an offer code for 20% off today, um, in the email and in the chat, if you're actually in the webinar, if you're watching me on social media, sign up for the webinar and you'll get the 20% off. When you buy it from us on our website, it's a digital download. It's emailed to you in a PDF. Some people like that. Other people prefer a physical copy. So if you prefer a physical copy, don't buy the digital and print it. That's too much money of paper and ink. Just click this Amazon link here. And when you do, you'll be taken to our actual Amazon page and it'll get to you in about two days and it's a physical copy. It looks like this, okay? Now, um, I also have an online course and I just beefed up this online course. If you've already purchased the online course, go into your course and check it out because I just made it exponentially bigger. So if you've already purchased it, you have access, log into the LMS and I sent you an email today letting you know that that, that happened. But if you'd like the online course, the online course comes with the digital study guide and it comes with a bunch of other stuff. So let me show you what the online course looks like. So this is the online course here. I made it a lot bigger. So if you've purchased this already, you will see a huge difference. Um, I added all these modules and quizzes and explanation videos and stuff like that. So in it, you're going to get the study guide. So when you order our online courses, you always get the study guide. So don't buy both. You get it in the online course. And then I have videos for every single content category, the quizzes at the end online, and then an explanation video for all the questions. And I do this for all six content categories in the study guide. And then I have a constructed response one for those of you who have to write or an open response, some of it, sometimes it's called. And I have extra writing prompts that are separate from the study guide. So you get it in the study guide, there's one in here, and then there's two more here. And, um, how to do it, how to write for this particular test. And then here is an extra, this is the old course, which used to just be a two hour webinar with some PowerPoints. This is great, a lot of people like it. I kept it in there, but then I added all this other stuff broken down, okay? So just in case you guys want a little bit more, that is the online course and remember it comes with the digital study guide, okay? So you're gonna get some links and all of that and, um, and an offer code. It's in the chat. I believe Yana is, uh, she has it in there, the offer code, and we'll also send you an email with all the links. So don't worry about that. Okay. All right. Now let's get into the actual webinar. Um, we are going to go through the practice, uh, the free practice test that you got with the webinar. And I'm going to go through it and show you a few things. If you have any specific questions, you can throw them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. Like inter when I'm uh, done with my presentation, I'll come back and check that out and um, we'll work on that. Now, a couple of things I want you to think about in terms of test strategy, especially for the ESOL exam, right? So let me talk about the lingo a little bit. Sometimes people call it ESOL, E-S-O-L, and sometimes people call it E-S-L. They both are used interchangeably and they both mean kind of the same thing. Um, so what the difference is, is very minute. Basically, ESOL is English speakers of other languages, E-S-O-L. And E-S-L is English as a second language. It basically just means that whoever's in your classroom, if they're ESOL or ESL, it means that English, because we're teaching in American public schools, which is English, English is the second language, L2, okay? The second language. So you'll see L1 and L2 on the test. L1 is your student's first language. So I use a lot of Spanish speakers examples because I live in Florida and our students, a lot of our ESOL students come from Central America and Puerto Rico and stuff like that. And so we 
we have, I ha should say I, I have a lot of experience with Spanish speaking students or students who speak Spanish. Now, not all Central Americans speak Spanish. There are lots of different languages. I just want to make that clear. There's lots of different dialects, but I'm, I'm just speaking about my own experience. So that's kind of my go-to. You may live in California where you have a larger Asian population. Perhaps your students speak Japanese or Chinese. You may live in Michigan or areas in New York where you have pockets of Arabic speaking students or whatever. Um, so ESOL doesn't mean just Spanish speaking students. It means all different types of students whose first language, L1, is not English, who they're learning a second language. Um, language L2. Okay. So you'll see L1, that's the student's first language. L2 is the language they're trying to learn, the second language. Okay. And you're going to see that play out in the practice test questions. All right. The other thing I want you to be on the lookout for is anything that is about being culturally responsive or having cultural competence. Obviously, when we are teaching ESOL students, we are working with students from other cultures. Culture and language are intertwined. They are like, you can't separate them, okay? So we wanna make sure that while we are teaching this second language and encouraging students to acquire that second language, that we are also celebrating and letting them know that we appreciate and respect their first language and their, first, their, their culture, where they are from. Um, we don't want to ever make a student feel like you know, they, they don't belong. And this has a lot to do with the affect filter. It's called the affect filter. I cover that a lot in the book and I cover it in the online course extensively. The affect filter is something we want to reduce. So when the affect filter is high, the student is stressed out. The student feels like he or she doesn't belong. They're afraid to speak out in class. They're afraid to, you know, try and make mistakes and things like that, right? When we lower the affect filter, the student is motivated to learn the second language. The student is motivated to try and maybe mess up and that's okay. So we want to create a classroom where the affect filter is low and that students feel comfortable to have choppy English at first, to try writing a sentence in English, to try raising their hand and answering the question or maybe reading aloud. And the way we do that is we never put students on the spot. We never ask them to read aloud unless they want to. We, you know, we're we're being human beings. We're being kind. I know it's so crazy. Just be kind. And um, teachers are kind. In my experience, all the teachers I've met are very kind people. And um, so we understand our students and we know that their struggle of coming here and not knowing the language and all of that. But just try to put yourself in their shoes. If you went to Italy, I use this example a lot, and you're in a cafe and everybody is yelling Italian and speaking really quickly, what are you going to do? You're going to retreat to the back of the cafe. You're not going to just walk up to the counter and start rattling off Italian, you're going to be like, oh my God, what am I doing here? What am I going to say? How do I say this? Right? So think about your student who's younger in high school and doesn't want to stand out or anything like that. So just, you know, create a, an inclusive, culturally responsive classroom where the affect filter is low. Remember for your test, when the affect filter is low, motivation is high and the student feels good about what they are doing. Okay. All right. And online study guide includes everything except for the physical book with 20% off. Yes. And thank you so much for your question. The uh, digital study guide and the online course, we will be offering you 20% off. I can't do discounts on Amazon because Amazon is the publisher and the, the the shipper. So um, if you want a physical book, unfortunately, we can't offer the 20% off, but it is worth it if you really want a physical tangible um, book like this. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Let's hop over to my presentation. Now the presentation is going to be the questions just projected in front of you. All right. So let's go ahead and share screen here. All right. So we are talking about the ESOL, ESL certification exam. Again, this is going to cover New York's exam, ETS if you're from Jersey, um, if you're from Louisiana, uh, I'm trying to think of all the other states that use the ETS exam, uh, so many states. And then you may be taking a different ESL certification exam. This covers it all. So remember, we don't if you're looking for exact questions, you're probably not going to get that here today. But if you're looking for general ideas, concepts, strategy that you can apply across context, this is definitely the presentation for you. All right, let's hop in right away. This is number one in the study guide. Again, you don't have to have it in front of you. You can just follow along. I always like to start with the answer choices first. And you can see I just have uh, one word answers here, so I can't do much there. Let's go to the question. When 
ELL students adopt American culture and speak English at home, at school, and with friends. They are in what stage of cultural adaptation? Okay, let's talk about this. They have, they're, they are not speaking the first language now. They are speaking English. We're going to call this L2 at school, at home, and with friends. So this is assimilation. Now, I probably rewrite this question a little bit. Maybe um, let me just expand on it. This is when the students abandon their first language and their for their culture and they totally assimilate into american culture i'm, I'm speaking as l2 as Amer uh, english because this test is about american public schools if you were teaching in a different country l2 would be different right but for us the second language the the language that the students are trying to learn is english okay when they totally abandon the first language so let's say the student is from um, venezuela okay and the student comes here in first grade and then over the course of five or six years the student learns english and then adopts american culture dresses just like his or her friends in school totally abandons his his venezuelan culture and kind of doesn't want to be associated with it that's assimilation now we don't want to encourage that we want we want students to keep their culture but kids don't like to stand out they want to look like everyone else right for the most part you may have a student in your class who likes to stand out but kids they don't want to be the kid that's different in class you know so they're trying to assimilate and that's okay but it's okay to also encourage students and get excited about their culture. And that's why being culturally competent is like, hey, I, I find your culture so interesting. Let's read a story about it. Or, hey, we have a few kids here from Venezuela. I found a story about Venezuelan students. And then also reading stories about American students and reading stories about Chinese students and just celebrating culture so it's not like kids have to abandon what their first their first culture now this can be really hard on parents this is something to think about um you know a lot of parents bring their students here their children here for a better life and the students get that they come to school and they learn the language and they become kind of american and then the parents are sad because the student no longer speaks spanish or the student no longer speaks japanese and the student is totally americanized this happens a lot so um Anyway, it's just it's just one of those things. Now, acculturation is when you speak. I'm going to talk about the L2. You're speaking English in school and at work. But when you go home and you talk to your parents or your aunties, you're speaking your home language and you're celebrating your culture in your home. You're continuing to embrace your culture. So you kind of have two feet in two different places. You have one foot in the in the heritage language. That's L1. First language can be called heritage language, home language or first language. And you're also in that culture. And then when you're at school and when you're at work, you're in L2, the second language. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, um, you know, straddling the two different cultures. Socialization is just when students are interacting with one another. They're using social cues. They are standing up for themselves. They're asking questions, things like that. And multiculturalism is just a lot of different cultures in an area, eating each other's food, talking with each other, celebrating each other's culture. Okay. But this particular question is assimilation. All right. Let's have a look at this. All right. So we have a big scenario here and it looks like I'm looking at the same type of answer choices here. Let's have a look at the question. Rosa lives in the United States and teaches at a local university. All right. She speaks English at work and has many American colleagues and friends. She also maintains relationships with people from her culture with whom she regularly speaks her home language and maintains her first culture. Okay, so this is acculturation. So going back on what I already explained in, in question one, this is going to be acculturation. I definitely recommend you know the difference between these particular um, cultural adaptations is what they're called. All right, let's have a look at this. Now, this is a scenario question. These are the ones that have the big scenario here, and then you have these big answer choices. Now, what I would expect, what I um, suggest you do is start with the answer choices first and eliminate any bad words and zero in on good words. Let's have a look at A. Call home and ask their parents to speak with the students. This is typically never the correct answer on any teacher certification exam. Well, why? We call home and talk to parents all the time. We do, but this test is usually testing your ability to differentiate instruction to assist students when they need it. And calling home and telling parents to take care of it is usually not the correct answer, okay? Calling home to share 
uh, achievements and good feedback is good, but this is kind of punitive and you want to stay away from anything punitive. B, design relevant lessons and activities aligned with the student's interest. Ooh, I like this. This has relevant lessons. Remember when we are teaching students in any content category and in any teacher certification exam, relevant lessons is good. That helps to motivate students. You know, I give this example all the time. I was a reading teacher in high school. They didn't want to read about, you know, skateboards and stuff. They wanted to read about cool stuff like war and love and revenge, you know? So giving them relevant lessons um, is important. And then aligning with the student's interests, this also helps with autonomy and motivation. So I like B, I'm gonna put a little star there. C, continue doing the same thing and allow students to engage when they are ready. All right, this sounds like the opposite of differentiation, doing the same thing. This is kind of a bad answer choice. I'm gonna cross it off. D, separate the students so they are working with English speakers only. Any English only on this exam is wrong. Bilingual education is key. That means we're supporting students in their first language. If they have to speak their first language, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And you wanna encourage them to, to move towards the second language. I've heard people say, well, why are they speaking Spanish? They should be speaking English. Why does it matter to you? You know, they need to use their home language or they feel more comfortable, that's fine. If they are working on their second language, they need support in their first language also. And not only that, not only is it the nice thing to do and the tolerant thing to do, it's also backed by research. Bilingual education works better than English only practices all day, every day, especially when we're talking about academic second language acquisition. So anytime you see English only, cross it off or anything insinuating that. Also the word only is strong language and in standardized testing, strong language, we wanna stay away from typically in an answer choice. B is my best answer, let's have a look at the questions. A new teacher has several ELL students in class. The teacher knows they are not participating as much as the other students and the, they want to, uh, the teacher wants to motivate them to engage. Well, if we want to motivate them, relevant lessons and align to the student interest is always going to be number one. And this goes for any teacher certification exam. This would be one you might see on the reading exam. This might be one you see on the social studies exam. This kind of goes across all contexts. All right, let's have a look at number four, reading the answer choices first. Design activities that promote critical thinking and are aligned with the state academic standards. Okay, A's got all the good words. Let's talk a little bit about critical thinking. Why would they put this in an answer choice on an ESOL exam? This is very important. Sometimes when we are teaching ESOL, especially for new teachers, and I'm talking about myself in this context, when someone doesn't understand our, our language, we automatically go to, they don't know what I'm talking about, right? In fact, I had somebody comment on my YouTube channel once about a student, their ESOL students not being able to think critically because they didn't understand the language. And this is a common misconception. Your students, whether they're ESL or not, can think critically, all right? Unless they have a cognitive disability, um, that's specific to this, they can think critically and we wanna encur encourage them to think critically. What they may not have yet is the second language. So we want to promote critical thinking perhaps in their first language and have them kind of move over into L2, their second language. We always want to be aligned with the state academic standards. It's very important. And when we do this, we are being culturally sensitive. And I can see that word here because we want to make sure that we're pushing students to critical thinking, regardless of where they're from, who they are, how much money they have, whether they speak uh, English or not, because when we move students towards critical thinking, they become better at all things. And we want to keep standards high. We never want to lower the standards. We might scaffold, we might differentiate, we might help them, but the standard stays high. And this means that we are pushing all students, regardless of where they're from and who they are, towards a better education. And that's why A has all the good words and I like it and I'm going to circle it. B, continually praise her ELL students for making strides in reading and writing. Now, B is good. This is probably one of those where three or four of the answer choices are going to look good to you. And this happens a lot on the test. I get, I get these emails a lot. When I took the test, all four of the answer choices could be the right one. No, there's always one right answer unless they tell you to choose more than one. In this case, we have A, B, and C, C and D and no boxes to tick. So this is one right answer. So B is good, but it's not as good as A. 
A has got academic standards, critical thinking. Those are good words. Be on the lookout for those in the answer choices. C, implement a system of rewards for students when they reach their learning goals. Again, if you're a new teacher, C sounds really good. But a system of rewards is extrinsic. Extrinsic rewards, Jolly Ranchers, extra time on the playground, whatever. Typically not the right answer. Not always the wrong answer, but it's typically not the right answer. It's certainly not as good as A. A is still my front runner. D, encur encourage students to work in groups and help each other learn. D sounds good too, cooperative learning. All of these are things we might do in the classroom, but A is best. Let's look at the, uh, the question. Ms. Jones is a teacher at a school with a large ELL student population. What can she do to be sure she is being culturally sensitive? Well, A. And again, she's got all different types of students and she has a lot of ELL students. We want to think critically and we want to make sure we're aligned to the standards. All right, let's have a look at five answer choices first. Looks like a scenario. A, introduce the student to the class and have her partner up with a fluent English speaker. All right, introducing the student to the class sounds like you're increasing the affect filter. Remember I told you you want to bring down that affect filter? And uh, that could freak a kid out, all right? Uh, think about it. Kid just got here from Venezuela, Guatemala, or Japan, or wherever, and you're like, oh, let's stand in the front of the class so I can introduce you to everybody. Oh my gosh, like, I would, be, I would just want to crawl in a hole. So A sounds like it's going to increase the affect filter instead of reduce it, so I'm going to cross that off. B, meet with the student privately and allow the student to engage when she is ready. Okay, I like B. Let's look at C. Call home and ask her parents to encourage her to engage in class. Again, calling home is typically not the right answer. D, have the student work alone with a translator until she is ready to join class. D looks okay, but here's the thing. We're not, some of you may have paraprofessionals in your classes that will help translate. Some of you don't. Some of you are not going to have that opportunity. And kind of separating the student out with a translator instead of using the translator to support seems like a bad answer to me. I'm going to cross off D. Let's have a look at the question. A new ELL student has enrolled in school. She keeps to herself and is quiet in class. What would be the most appropriate approach? Well, B is. Let's talk about the silent stage here. When this is the very first stage of second language acquisition. It's called the silent stage or pre-production, meaning they're not doing anything except trying to survive, okay? Think about it. I gave you the, the, the scenario of you in an Italian cafe, right? You're sitting there trying to absorb and figure out what's going on. You're not going to engage and raise your hand and read aloud when you don't know the language at all. You are trying to just figure out the noises that are coming out of people's mouths, figure out what they're saying, equate it to different things in the room. You're trying to get to the lunchroom. You know, it's just, it's very, very anxiety inducing. So as teachers, we want to honor the silent stage and allow students to just kind of observe, take everything in, be quiet and listen. Remember our listening comprehension in a second language comes first before our speaking comprehension or before our speaking vocabulary. So honoring that silent stage allows the student to develop the listening comprehension very important and that's why b is the right answer there all right let's have a look at number six again scenario question design curriculum and instruction that integrates language and culture whenever you see these two together pay attention i like it these are good words in the test specifications and on the exam B, insist students immerse themselves completely strong language in the new language. Don't like it, strong language, and it sounds English only to me. C, communicate with parents for an at-home plan to support the classroom. You know, if I'm a new teacher, C sounds good, but it's not as good as A. I'm going to cross it off. D, choose lessons that are easily transferred to the first language. Again, if I'm a new teacher, D sounds good too. A is the best because language and culture are together. You cannot separate them. Remember what I talked to you about being culturally responsive. Language and culture are intermingled. They, they can't be separated out. Let's have a look at the question. In a culturally and linguistically diverse class, what can the teacher do to ensure students are receiving culturally responsive education? All right. Here's also, I told you there's going to be some um, like cues or hints. We have Culturally and linguistically. What does li linguistics mean? Language, cultural and language, language and culture. Sometimes it's obvious. Go with the obvious when you see this. Sometimes people will say, oh, that's too obvious. That can't be it. No, it is. If you see something with a big green light on the answer choice, take it. 
It's, they're not expecting you to have a master's degree in ESOL education. They're trying to get you through this exam so you can be a teacher. So this one's pretty obvious. Go with the obvious answer. All right, number seven. Again, I've got these acculturation, assimilation, enculturation, and social socialization. Let's have a look at the question. Learning a new culture's behaviors, expectations, and norms through interacting with the teacher and other students is called, this is enculturation. Think in the culture. I'm in the culture and I'm watching the teacher and I'm talking to my friends and I'm watching them do whatever they do at the store and I'm watching them on the playground. I am interacting. I'm in the culture and culturalization. I've already explained these other three, but C is the answer to this. Okay. Let's have a look at eight. Now we're getting into L2 and you can see L1s and L2s here. All right. Let's look at the answer choices first. Immerse students completely strong language in L2 and only strong language allow them to speak. Remember, strong language, no. Also, that's English only practices. Just say no to English only practices when you are an ESOL or ESL teacher or if you're any teacher. Just say no to that. Bilingualism, best, best practice, bilingual education. B, have students speak L2 socially in groups and then move to academic vocabulary. You may think that's okay. Not bad. I don't love it. I don't hate it. I'm going to leave it. C, make connections, love this, between L1 and L2, focusing on the second language, which is what we need to do, while scaffolding, good word, good word, good word, to support L1. So we're making connections, maybe cognates, this is one way to make connections, uh, words that look and sound the same, um, like for example, uh, information in, in Spanish is information in English. Those are called cognates where the word is very similar with similar pronunciation. So we might make that connection to show students the, the similarities between L1 and L2, but we do want to push to L2. That's why they're in the classroom. They got to learn the second language, but we want to scaffold support, keeping those standards high and using scaffold like you do on a building to help students climb up and reach that standard. So C looks like it's my answer. D, create engaging lessons to support L2 acquisition as soon as possible. I like D as well, but it's not as good as C. Let's have a look at A. What is the most effective? This is key. Most effective. All of these are effective except A. I hate A, but all of these are pretty effective. We need the most effective way to teach ELs in the social science class. C is the best um, and D is out and B is out. All right, let's have a look at number nine. A well-maintained teacher website where students and parents can access information regularly. I like it. Don't hate it. I'll leave it. B, colorful posters in the classroom to display information. All right. Weekly emails sent to every parent and student. All right. A detailed monthly newsletter sent home with students in the students' home languages. D stands out as a good practice because... I've got that home language there. I'm supporting L1. Their parents may not speak English and they may never speak English. Some parents never learn the second language and that's okay. That's, that doesn't affect me in any way. <laughs> so if I have the opportunity to throw my newsletter into Google Translate and just give the student a different newsletter that has all the same information, but in a different language, it's, it's fine. It's not a big deal. I got chat GPT can do it for me. I got Google Translate. It's really not a big deal. So this is good because this is being culturally responsive and culturally um, competent, which is what we need to be as teachers. Let's read the question. Which of the following would be the most effective way to communicate to students and parents about upcoming classroom events and deadlines. Well, the colorful posters are out because we need to speak to students and parents. Colorful posters around the classroom, the students are going to see those only unless it's like open house night, but this is B is out for that reason. And then a website and emails are related. They're done on the computer. Not everybody has computer access. Sometimes kids have to walk to the library to get on a computer. So A and C is out. I learned that the hard way one time. I, I signed a big research paper in my biology class. I had a couple of kids who were, um, whose first language was not English and their parents didn't speak English at all. And I assigned this big research paper. I was ninth grade biology and I thought I was just like so awesome. And uh, they had to do some of the work at home. And it got out to me that one of my students walked to the library like an hour to get there to do my assignment. And she was a way overachiever. And I found out, I was like, oh my gosh. And so I modified the lesson so they had time to use the computer lab in the school. 
um, to do it. But not everybody, we forget, not everybody has access to what we have access to. So being culturally responsive in that way as well. And that's why um, D is the best answer. And the last question, let's have a look at the answer choices. Allow students to use the internet to search for confusing concepts. All right. B, have students create a word list of confusing words they will look up after the lesson. It's okay. Looking words up is kind of not the best answer. We do it, but I, I don't love it. C, have a guest speaker come in and talk to the students about Native American culture. A lot of people like a guest speaker, but a guest speaker is just a, um, it's just a lecture. It's just a different person lecturing to the class. They might be passing out artifacts, but it's, it's just a lecture. And D, help students activate prior knowledge to understand complex concepts. Activating prior knowledge, this is a reading strategy for comprehension. We want to figure out a way to bring students' experiences and understanding into their reading. This is very helpful in ESOL education. Um, and so we want to make sure we do that. Let's have a look at the question. Mr. Suni will be starting a lesson on Native American poetry. He knows some of the language and concepts will be challenging. What can he do at the beginning? This is a beginning, this is a beginning reading strategy. The beginning of the lesson to help students grasp difficult concepts presented in the poetry. Well, D all day, best thing there. All right. Now, let me just show you a couple of things here. Um, let me show you. You may get some questions on some more complex linguistics concepts like stress and phonics and things like that. And I have a lot of information in that particular part of the study guide. All right. So I have like the international alphabet here. I have, you know, there's going to be some grammar and I've got a lot of grammar here, but I also go through stress and unstressed syllables here. I go through, you know, voiced consonants, voiceless consonants. You might have stuff on there about actual like pronunciation. It's not the entire test. And again, you're not in the classroom yet, but you may have some of this. So if you get the study guide, I highly recommend you look closely at uh, the second content category. I think you should look at everything, obviously, but this one really focuses on those stressed and unstressed syllables, how we say words, how students speaking a second language say words and things like that. This will help you with that too. So I just wanted to make sure you guys knew where to get that information in the study guide. And there's also going to be some reading and fluency questions on phonics, phonological awareness, things like that. And I go over this extensively in the course as well, but I just want to make sure you saw that in the study guide. All right, let me look and see what kind of questions we have here. Um, what course to purchase to pass the basic practices? Okay, we're not talking about that test yet. Um, okay, in Jersey, I was told to take an exam for language testing to apply for ESL certification class. Yeah, different states do different things. So some states make you take an ESOL exam. Some states make you take like an online course. Um, either way, this is going to help you. This free webinar is going to help you. But if you're taking a certification exam, definitely consider for sure using my free study guide here and then perhaps buying the study guide if you want more practice qu test questions. Um, all right, somebody just purchased the online course. Perfect, I hope you like it. Let us know what you think. We have a lot of five-star reviews on our ESOL products. So people really like them. We cover everything. And so that's really important there. Now, let me show you where you can get more information. So this test focuses a lot on reading too. All right. And I have extensive reading in here and theorists and stuff like that. But I have some free resources on reading as well in, on my YouTube channel that are really, um, really, really important. Okay. So let me go to my YouTube channel. Hang on. Somebody's asking, how helpful would this be for the Texas? I actually looked at the Texas test specs for this book. In fact, I say it here. Hang on. I have it on the second page or whatever. Um, yeah, the... ESL 154, English as a second language, MTEL, and of course the Praxis 5362. So I aligned it to Texas as well. So it's going to cover all of that for you. It may be in a different order, but it covers all the concepts here. I use the Texas specs to kind of draft this as well. Okay. All right. Let me show you where to get some more reading videos. There are going to be reading questions on your ESL exam because you're teaching students who don't speak English how to read. And you're starting with those foundational skills like sound on, sounds only 
and things like that. So let me just show you really quickly where to get that. So this is my YouTube channel here. And if you go down to, well, the test strategy is really good. Definitely check out the test strategy playlist, but then also this teaching reading playlist. I have tons of reading videos here. Um, I also cover reading in the online course specifically for ESOL. But if you're trying to get some free stuff, cause you know, I know you're a teacher and you don't have a lot of extra money to spend. My YouTube channel is going to help you. All right. And I have all of the different tests here. I have math. I have subject area live sessions. You can probably find like I got PLT. I just did that one. Praxis core I did last weekend. I'm constantly doing free webinars, but they're all right here under these free live subject area sessions, just like what I'm doing here with you today. So definitely check out the teaching reading playlist and also test strategy. And we will link that up in the email that's going out to you guys. Then I also am on TikTok with shorter videos and I have videos like evidence-based discussion, qualitative versus quantitative data. These little videos are going to help support you in different areas of different exams. They all kind of test these overarching skills, right? Um, you know, and then I have everything from like how to write an essay, APA style. If you're in graduate school and you need a little help with APA, I got a lot of short videos here. Follow me on TikTok. I really love TikTok. It's a lot of fun to do the, the shorter videos. Of course, I've got my Facebook page which is where a lot of you um, have seen me there. And of course I'm on LinkedIn, um, but I don't really spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, but it's just, it's just so boring. <laughs> LinkedIn is so boring, but I'm on there with my videos. So if you prefer LinkedIn, you can get all these videos there as well. Now, I just want to reiterate that we do have the ESOL um, study guide. That's this light purple book here. You can check out our five-star reviews. And even in our online course, there were a couple of one-star reviews, but they were really good reviews. So I think somebody clicked one star and then they wrote like, it's fantastic. I passed my test. So have a look in there. You can see that we have five-star reviews. And then remember this online course comes with the digital study guide. Don't buy both. And the um, new online course has all of this stuff in it. So if you bought the online course a couple weeks ago, go back in, log into lms.kathleenjasper.com and check out the new course be in there. All right. Okay. Let me ch check. Okay. How about Michigan? This is going to cover everything. So again, this study guide covers many, many, many. Oh, I need to stop sharing here. There we go. This study guide covers many, many different certification exams. So I aligned it to all the different ESOL exams and we've helped thousands of people all over the country pass their ESOL exam. So if you're looking for some study material, consider this, but it is not aligned to any one test. It's aligned to lots of different tests, has, has two full practice tests in the back and a writing task. And the online course has an additional two prompts and videos to go with those two prompts for the writing task. So it's all there. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. All right. So somebody's asking me about one-to-one -one academic court, um, Co uh, coaching. I don't do one-to-one -one anymore. That's how I started my business. People would come to my office and like, I would do one-to-one -one or we would do it online. I just have too many people. I've got thousands now. There's no way to put myself in that, that many places. So, but I highly recommend the online course if you're looking for more in depth. Okay. All right. What time is it? Oh, wow. I'm on time. All right, everybody. Well, listen, um, I'm so happy you were here with me today for this Saturday webinar. Remember, I've helped thousands, I think close to 80 or 90,000 uh, teachers pass their teacher certification exams all over the country. I've been doing this for a long time and I understand these exams really, really well. Think about those strategies I talked to you about. Think like a test maker, not a test taker. Look at those answer choices first when you can. It's not gonna work on every single question. Um, if you're not comfortable with that strategy, don't use it. You know, if you have a writing task, make sure you go to the task first and then look over the writing. Um, again, you can get those prompts in here. You can also Google ESOL writing prompts. If you want to save money, Google ESOL writing prompts um, for teacher certification exams. See what pops up. Somebody might have made a Quizlet about it. You know, there's all kinds of ways to get that information as well. But um, we definitely recommend our stuff. I love our products and we're constantly working on making them better. Oh, one more thing. I forgot to tell you guys this. I'm working on, um, I have a lot of uh, 
audio courses now. So I just published this teaching reading audio course and they're really cool. It's just, it's almost like a podcast in modules on the, um, in your headphones, it goes on your phone and people are really enjoying these, especially when you pair them with, um, the study guide. It's like a really good combo. The, uh, the, the online course and the study guide. Am I viewing this tab? There it is. Yeah. So the online courses are, um, or the audio courses are like the online courses, but they go on your phone and they go really well with the study guide. Right now, I only have the leadership and then the teaching reading, but I'm doing more. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do ESOL and I'm going to do um, special ed and all of them. I'm going to try to make this an option for our auditory learners. Okay. So if you need to take the reading or the leadership, check those out. It's a great way and they're cheap. They're like $15.99. Okay. All right. That's it for today. I'm so glad that, um, oh, thank you, Richardson. I appreciate that. That's very nice to say. Thank you. Um, that makes my day actually. Um, I am happy to help you guys just email us at info at kathleenjasper.com. And, um, you can get all that information. We have special education. We have math. We have all kinds of test prep for you. So go ahead and email us. You will get, if you're in the webinar here, you're going to get an email from me in about 20, 30 minutes with all of the information we talked about today and the offer code. So if you got the offer code in the chat, great, but wait to buy. So you can get that 20% off and I hope you have a wonderful week.